All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2? And I think I want to start you at uh, verse 14 again. 2 Timothy 2, 14. You should have my translation of 2 Timothy in front of you as well. The reason why I'm going to start you at 2 Timothy 2, 14 is that's really when the paragraph begins. Uh, in, in which we find uh, the, verse, the verse we're going to study tonight, it's in a paragraph that begins at verse 14. So 2 Timothy 2.14 in my Bible, my, my Bible, my translation in your Bibles, uh, we're going to see in verse 21, we're going to finish off verse 21 this evening, 2 Timothy 2.21, where we've been talking about vessels of honor in relation to the Christian sanctification, and specifically Timothy's sanctification, and in relation to the false doctrine in, uh, in Asia at that time. And Paul's going to define for us what a vessel of honor is. So we're going to talk about the doctrine of sanctification quite a bit here this evening, which is an extremely important subject when we talk, because we, when we talk about sanctification, we're talking about the Christian way of life. And so uh, when we're experiencing our sanctification, we're experiencing fellowship with God, we're experiencing our salvation, and uh, so a very important subject. So sanctification is uh, looking at the Christian's fellowship with God and other Christians uh, from the perspective that we've been set apart to serve the Lord exclusively. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, I talked to Pastor Jim Ricard uh, this morning. Got me and of course, I, many of you know, I got a Dane with him, with him uh, at GBC back in 1998. And uh, we're going to have, a, Jim and I are going to have a, a conference out in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, I'll be out in Massachusetts in September anyways for my family. My tr I'm not going to go out this summer. I'm going to go out in September because of uh, a couple of things I'm doing with my dad. So um, we're going to have uh, a conference. Jim and I are going to have a conference at his church, Grace Fellowship Church in Plainville, Mass. At his place, it'll be September 17th through the 20th. 
And uh, Jim and I will be the, uh, speaking, and also we're going to have Dr. Von Macha, who uh, follows our teaching here, and he does a lot of stuff with apologetics. So we're going to have him. He's spoken at Mars Hill down in Alabama. And so he'll be uh, uh, looking at, uh, he'll be contributing to this, uh, uh, this uh, conference, that's, which is going to be about evangelism. And I believe that um, uh, so that, so Jim and I will take a, a different aspects of evangelism, and then Vaughn will look at it from you know, the apologetics uh, perspective and stuff, and uh, evolution and atheism and all that. So uh, we're going to be, uh, that's September 17th through the 20th, so mark it in your calendar. And uh, we're going to be at uh, Grace Fellowship Church there in uh, Plainville, Massachusetts. So uh, what else do I think? That's about it for his, uh, uh, for uh, announcements. I'll be announcing that uh, periodically as, when, uh, as, well, as well as when I'm going to be back out east. It looked like it's pretty sh- I, have to, I haven't bought the airline tickets yet, but my uh, summer vacation is actually going to take place. Our summer break is actually going to take place in September. And I'll be gone for three weeks. So I'll be, it'll be September. It looks, I'm looking... Uh, looking for plan it, planning it for September 6th through the 26th. So uh, that uh, that'll be uh, I'll be announcing that when I once I buy those inline tickets. So I got to do that soon. All right, that's about it for the announcement. So let's take a moment of silent prayers as our custom. We do this. How come you're not behind the board tonight? Oh, did you get? I'm not gonna. I'll, I'm just kind of weird of getting used to you sitting over there with your uh, you know your father over there. So, but that's all right. You're right back at your old spot. All right, let's take a moment of silent prayer as, as is our custom. We take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to see if we need to confess any sins to the Father. Do what 1 John 1, 9 states. If we confess our sins to the Father, He, God, the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins with the result that He purifies us from each and every wrongdoing, even the sins that we commit out of ignorance to, uh, to the Bible. Uh, remember, uh, we're in the same way that we're uh, saved, based, just, declared justified by God through faith in Jesus Christ, and our salvation is based upon the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember, when God uh, forgives us our sins after conversion so that we're restored to fellowship with Him, He's doing so based upon the death of His Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. And uh, so with that, uh, when we're restored to fellowship with God, we maintain that fellowship by bringing our thoughts into obedience to what the Spirit says to us through the teaching of the Word of God, which He's inspired. When we're doing that, we're obeying the commands of Ephesians 5.18, to, let, uh, to be filled with the Spirit in Colossians 3.16, to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our soul. Both commands, when we obey them, bear the same results, and well, they should, because the Holy Spirit has inspired the Scriptures. Uh, also, remember, uh, Paul meant, uh, we talk about why does Paul say, let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our soul, in your soul, in Colossians 3.16, and he doesn't say that in Ephesians 5.18, but instead says, be filled with the Spirit. Why is he... What's the deal with that? Well, in Ephesians, he's emphasizing the Spirit's role in our fellowship with God, our dependence upon Him. And also in Colossians, he's emphasizing with the Colossian church uh, the de- their dependence upon the Word of God in order to have fellowship. So the Holy Spirit is inspired the Scriptures, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, and He speaks to us through the Scriptures. And if we're out of fellowship with God, we can't obey what Jesus said to the woman at the well, John 4, 23 and 24. We can't worship the Father by means of the Spirit and truth if we're out of fellowship with God. So the Bible, you can understand it, certain parts of it academically, you know, the histor- history and stuff, and pull out some things. But if, you're not, uh, if you don't have the Spirit, that's why an unbeliever can't understand the things of God, Paul talked about that in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And that's why a believer out of fellowship with God cannot uh, understand this thing of God, things of God. So that's why sometimes you wonder, how comes, and I've always, it's, I learned this a long time ago, you could have somebody who comes and listens to the Word of God, and they're so positive, they love the Word of God, and they get it, and they're doing something in their life, and you talk to another person, and they're critical, they got a bad attitude. What is the difference between the two people? Well, one's out of fellowship for whatever reason, and the other's in fellowship with God, because they're listening to the same message and getting different things out of it. One's a critic, and one's positive. One's listening to it in, in a humble way. So it all depends on where we're at in our head. And I've said this a million times, if your head's not right, if your thinking's not right, you're in deep trouble. We, need, we are all in deep trouble. I don't care if you're a pastor or a lay person. Our thinking is so critical. If we're not in fellowship, if we're not thinking the thoughts of God, uh, Paul taught this in Romans 8, 5 through 6, you know, uh, we have to uh, submit our, our mentality, our volition. We have to, through the function of our volition, submit our mentality to what God's saying in it through his spirit 
in the word of God. So that being said, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for another beautiful day out here in Iowa. We thank you for the great weather, and we thank you for uh, uh, this uh, spring and summer coming, and we just thank you, Father, for uh, the Word of God, Father. We thank you for your Word, and we thank you for the gift of the Spirit to help us understand your Word, and we just thank you for the things that we've been learning in 2 Timothy in our weekday classes and also in Colossians in our Sunday classes. We pray that these studies would be a blessing to your people and bring glory and honor to you and your son, Jesus Christ, along with the other studies on our website. And we thank you for Titus' service and all his hard work that he does in many areas of this ministry, with, especially with the website. We thank you for his work there. We thank you for the people on any meeting this evening through our website. We thank you for each and every one of them. And uh, also, uh, anybody in the future who will be uh, viewing these classes through YouTube or our website, with the video and the audio. Uh, we just thank you, Father, for them. And we thank you for Titus and Jody Thompson opening up their home to us. We thank you for their great hospitality and the sacrifice sacrifices they make so that we could uh, teach the Word of God here four times a week. Uh, we thank you for everyone in the audience here this evening, not only in the Thompson home, but those who might be viewing or listening to this class uh, through the website, as we said, uh, and... Uh, and also at a later date through the recordings. We pray that they would receive their necessary spiritual nourishment, help them to be active listeners, not passive, help them to be humble rather than arrogant and critical, help them to recognize, to be sensitive to the Spirit's guides and direction that, that what they're listening to is the Word of God. It is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection and how it applies to them as Christians. We just uh, help them to see this we pray that they would be transformed by what they're hearing and that they would uh, make application. Uh, we also pray that you would help me as the communicator to is be humble as well, to be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction. Help me to interpret accurately your word and communicate that interpretation to your people and guide them in the application, uh, not only for in, as in their, in their individual walk with you, but as a corporate unit that this church would walk with the same purpose, same uh, mentality, same goal to glorify you and your son Jesus Christ by growing to spiritual maturity. We uh, pray, Father, that you would uh, uh, do this. We also pray that you give Titus wisdom of the sound and recordings. We thank you again for his service and, and the technology that you've given to us. So, Father, we pray for this service in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Could you all look at 2 Timothy 2.14 in my translation? And the uh, reason why I'm going to start off in our translation is I'm going to read through verses 14 through 20, uh, verses 14 through 21. Uh, and uh, the reason why is because uh, they, my translation reflects our interpretation of these verses and what we've covered thus far in this chapter. And then we'll switch over to the New American Standard so that we can uh, look at some words in the Greek text and then uh, the original text, and then uh, go back to our translation. And then once we know what the, then we'll have an interpretation after we've determined what the text says, as is our custom, then we interpret it, and then we uh, find out what the application is for us here in the 21st century. So it says in 2 Timothy 2.14, continue to make it your habit of bringing into remembrance these things. And I saw these things, of course, remember, you should know it by now. I've repeated it a number of times. It refers to the things mentioned in verses 11 through 13, all of which were to encourage Paul, uh, Timothy to continue to remain faithful to Paul's gospel, his apostolic teaching, and also to warn Timothy uh, of uh, loss of rewards for unfaithfulness 
and rewards for uh, uh, encouragement for that he'll receive rewards from remaining faithful and assurance of his eternal security. So he is to make it his habit of bringing into remembrance these things. And that change, that's different from your translations. Your English translations uh, interpret it as Paul uh, t t telling Timothy to communicate these things to the Ephesian Christian community, but that's not what the original is saying, and I gave my explanation in detail in the past. So it's all on our website, and it's in written form as well. So he says, I, the next statement, he says in the next command, he says, I solemnly charge in the presence of the Lord not to at any time argue about words for absolutely no useful purpose, because those who hear are destroyed. He's talking about the manner in which the, the apostate uh, unrepentant apostate Christians and pastors in Ephesus, how they functioned in their, in, their, in their dealings with people and with each other. They were always arguing about the law. And uh, that's the nature of the heresy in Ephesus in the Roman province of Asia is they were misapplying and misinterpreting the law and just misunderstood the purpose of the law. Verse 15, I solemnly charge you to consciously make conscientiously make every effort to offer yourself up as an approved workman who is unashamed, <clears throat> excuse me, for the benefit of God, that being the Father, by specifically making it your habit of accurately teaching the message of truth. And then he goes on to say in verse 16, but for your benefit, continue to make it your habit of avoiding the words lacking content which are worldly, because they will, as a certainty, promote a greater depth of involvement with ungodliness. So he's saying in contrast to uh, being uh, accurately communicating the word of God, he's saying these apostate Christian pastors in the Roman province of Asia were teaching false doctrine. That's the, the, the false doctrines described as words lacking content, which are worldly. They're worldly because they come from Satan's cosmic system. All false doctrine comes from Satan and his cosmic system. And uh, he, remember, he's the author of religion and false doctrine. Heterod uh, he's not uh, for heterodoxy. Uh, he's not for orthodoxy. He's for heterodoxy. And so, uh, false doctrine. And so, notice what he says. It promotes a greater depth of involvement with ungodliness. False doctrine, when we listen to it and, put in a, and, a, and are obeying it, adhering to it, it produces ungodly character. It can't produce a godly character in a Christian because it's not based on truth, it's based upon lies. So we get lies from Satan's cosmic system, we get truth from God's word, which the Holy Spirit has inspired. That's why we emphasize the scriptures here and the study of them. Now, we see that when we listen and obey the sound, listen and obey sound doctrine, obedience is the key, uh, it will produce godly character in us. So that's why it's very important that the pastor, as Paul says to Timothy, accurately teach the message of truth. Now, we can't, uh, we can't uh, accurately teach the message of truth if we don't have sound hermeneutical principles. And this, uh, hermeneutics speaks of the science and the, the art of interpreting. And we, we believe in a literal, grammatical, historical interpretation of the scriptures, meaning we go back and study the original languages, uh, we compare scripture with scripture, we study the Bible in its historical context, and uh, we, when we talk about literal, that doesn't mean we ignore figures of speech, like Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Obviously, he's not a v literal vine. He's speaking, and his, and his, and his people, his, uh, his disciples are not branches. He's using figurative language to describe the re relationship between him and his disciples. So we take that into account. So we like to say, in other words, we like to take God at his word. If you look at all the cults and all the false doctrine that's out there in this world today and has been in the church throughout the, his, the, the centuries, it's always because of poor uh, interpretive skills, interpretive, uh, interpretive principles when interpreting the Bible. So we need to be, if we're going to teach the Word of God, we better know what hermeneutics is about, otherwise we're going to hurt ourselves and hurt our con congregation. So learn from somebody who knows what he's talking about. So then it says in verse 17, furthermore, their teaching will as a certainty possess the characteristic of spreading like a cancerous disease, among whom are Hymenaeus as well as Philetus. So that's interesting. There's two pastors. They're unrepentant apostate pastors in the Ephesian Christian community, and they correspond to Phygelus and Hermogenes, who are mentioned in 2 Timothy 1.15, 
who were leading the way with these apostate pastors in the Roman, uh, the Roman province of Asia and teaching false doctrine. They opposed Paul. And so then he goes on to say in verse 18, those of such character who have committed apostasy, apostasy with regards to the truth, and how do they do this? By communicating the resurrection has already taken place. Now apostasy, as is, is we described, it's in relation to the Christian uh, because it speaks of somebody who is obeying the truth and now is not. Uh, so the unbeliever has never obeyed the truth, so they cannot commit apostasy. It's only a Christian that can commit apostasy, because apostasy speaks of at one time you were obeying the truth habitually, and now you're not. So you're doing a 180 from being obedient, now you're doing a 180, we could say, and now you're living in habitual disobedience. So that's these two men, were doing. these two pastors were doing that, and uh, we see that uh, they taught that the resurrection had already taken place. Uh, remember, when we talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how does it apply to the Christian, uh, we're identified with Christ in his resurrection. We saw that in Romans 6. It's mentioned in Ephesians 2, Colossians 3. We've seen these passages in the past. So that sets up the guarantee of receiving a bodily resurrection, a resurrection body. Well, these guys only believed in the positional aspect of, uh, of, of, uh, of being identified with Christ in his resurrection, and that took place at your conversion, and they, they're, so they're saying, that's why Paul says, they're teaching that the resurrection has already taken place, meaning they don't look at the, the guarantee of a resurrection body that stems from being identified with Christ in his resurrection. So they didn't believe in a bodily resurrection. That's not unusual, because the uh, seen branch of the Judaizers, as well as the Sadducees, we see them in the Gospels, they didn't believe in a bodily resurrection. The Pharisees did. Um, we see that uh, uh, also in, in Greco-Roman culture, Greek-Roman culture in the first century, uh, it was not, uh, they didn't believe in a bodily resurrection, just like people in our culture in America in the West in the 21st century don't believe in a bodily resurrection as well. This kind of false doctrine was found in Corinth because Paul spends a, a, a huge chapter in, in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, talking, uh, uh, rebuking many of the Corinthian believers from saying that there's no uh, resurrection from, bodily resurrection from the dead, where you, these bodies are transformed into immortal bodies. So they, didn't they were listening to the culture, and probably the Judaizers, the Sadducees and the Essenes, who didn't believe in a bodily resurrection. So that's what's going on here in the text, what Paul's saying to Timothy. Then he goes on to say in verse, uh, in the result, oh, look at verse 18 again. He says, those of such character, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have committed apostasy with regards to the truth by communicating the resurrection has already taken place. Consequently, they're existing in the state of regularly overturning that which some believe. Some, you know, the church believes that the orthodox view, like Paul taught, is that there's going to be a bodily resurrection from the dead at the rapture of the church, which is imminent. So he's saying that these men were overturning the faith of certain Christians, meaning they were no longer believing in a bodily resurrection. That's what he means, that they were overturning that which some believe. They were overturning the uh, people were no longer, some people were no longer believing in a bodily resurrection. That's what he's saying here. Then he goes on to say in verse 19, however, despite this, this means despite the false doctrine, despite the apostasy among the pastors in Ephesus, despite the work of Hymenaeus and Philetus, despite the bad uh, results of this uh, false doctrine where the faith of uh, some Christians were no longer believing in a bodily resurrection from the dead, despite the, the damage it was doing to the church and, and, and spreading like a cancerous disease, Paul says this. He gives assurance to Timothy. And this is something that we see throughout this epistle where Paul talks about something that's really bad, negative, but he always gives assurance and encouragement. And this is something that we as pastors and as Christians should know you know, there's, 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 we have the good, bad news, but well, we have some good news. We have uh, the reality of the situation, great apostasy. The good news is that the church will endure despite the apostasy and the false doctrine. So he says in verse 19, however, despite this, the firm foundation, that's a building metaphor for the church. It's speaking of the church. So he says, however, despite this, the firm foundation constructed by God the Father remains standing. Why? Because it exists in the state of bearing this seal. Now when he says that, he's, allu he's alluding to the practice in the ancient world, in the first century, of affixing a seal, 
with a little motto on the building, affixing a seal to a building, which was constructed, which tells the people that what it was constructed for and who was it constructed by, what was the purpose, and who did it. So he's saying here that the church has a seal affixed to it, just like a building in the ancient world. And Paul's day would have a, a seal affixed to it, denoting the purpose and the ownership. So he says, uh, however, despite this, the firm foundation constructed by God the Father remains standing because it exists in the state of bearing this seal. The Lord knows, in an omniscient sense, those who are his. Quoting Numbers 16.5. So uh, remember, in Moses was having a rebellion. Against, uh, him and Aaron were being rebelled against by uh, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And so the Lord, they wanted to be uh, in the priesthood, and they thought um, uh, uh, that Aaron was, uh, they thought that Moses and Aaron were uh, uh, lording it over them and taking advantage of them and not letting them take part in this. But the Lord had chosen Moses and Aaron and didn't choose them. So uh, Moses basically said, well, the Lord will determine who, is, who he has chosen to lead this congregation and who he has not. And of course, the, the earth swallowed up Dathan and Abiram and Korah in their rebellion. So the, the Lord chose Moses and Aaron. And he made that emphatic. So Paul takes this and he's saying that the church has been chosen by God. Just like Moses and Aaron were chosen by God, so you and I, the church, has been chosen by God. And we're royal priests. We have a universal royal priesthood here in the church age. Only uh, Aaron and the Levitical priests were uh, uh, functioning as priests in Israel. So then he goes on to say, and we could actually say, consequently, I have also, I might change that, because the next command is a result clause, stemming from the, the quotation from Numbers 16, 5, which says that the church is owned by God and it's been created for his purpose. So also he says, and here's the purpose of why God has created us, the church. Also, each and every one who does confess the Lord's name, meaning as a believer in Jesus, must make it their top priority of abstaining from unrighteousness. That's the negative perspective of experiencing sanctification. We're to, to experience sanctification, we must abstain from unrighteousness. In other words, abstaining from sin. Then he says in verse 20, he, gives a, he, he elaborates on this, he advances upon this, and he gives a, a household metaphor. He goes, uh, indeed, in a large home, by no means does there exist only gold as well as silver vessels, but also wood as well as clay. In other words, on the one hand, some do exist in the state of being for honorable use, while on the other hand, some do exist in the state of being for dishonorable use. The large home tells us this is a wealthy person, because only a wealthy person could afford such a, a large home. And also, we know they're wealthy because only a wealthy person could uh, afford gold and silver uh, vessels. And so we see here that uh, just like there's, uh, we, that God here in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the metaphor is the, uh, the large home is God's house, the church. He's the homeowner, God the Father is. And the vessels for honorable use, the gold and silver, are those Christians who are experiencing this sanctification like Paul and Timothy and Onesiphorus and because they were obeying the gospel, and the vessels of dishonor were those Christians like the apostate pastors in, in Ephesus, Hymenaeus, and Philetus, who were uh, in false, into false doctrine, and like a vessel, like a vessel that was uh, filled with tr uh, refuse or refuse or ex human excrement. Uh, so the, the, the false teachers were filling their vessels, their bodies, their minds, their souls with false doctrine. So, uh, whereas the, the, the gold and silver, uh, the Christians who were like Paul that were obedient to the gospel and experiencing their sanctification, they were like the, uh, the gold and silver vessels in a wealthy homeowner's uh, place in the first century because they were filling themselves, uh, being used for honorable use, which is what? To learn and obey God's word and apply it in their lives. So he says, and indeed, <clears throat> excuse me, indeed in the large home, by no means does there exist only gold as well as silver vessels, but also wood as well as clay. In other words, on the one hand, some do exist in the state of being for honorable use, while on the other hand, some do exist in the state of being for dishonorable use. So he's affirming that there is apostate, uh, God is a, a permitted, though he disagrees with it, it's part of his permissive will, he's permitted apostate Christians to be in the church. And there are, of course, positive uh, ch Christians, Christians who are obedient. 
And so there are Christians that are faithful and Christians that are unfaithful. This is what he's affirming in the metaphor. Then we have an explanation in verse 21, which we're going to finish this evening. Therefore, if someone, and it's speaking in reference to the Christian, if some Christian cleanses himself from these things, he will certainly exist in the state of being a vessel for honorable use. So these things, is speaking of the false teachings, we saw this last week, the false doctrine of the apostate pastors in the Roman province of Asia, led by Hymenaeus and Philetus. And the way the Christian cleanses himself from these things is obeying the gospel, rejecting the false doctrine, and obeying the word of God, which is like water, because what, what does water do? It cleanses us. Um, hold your place. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 real quick. So when we obey the word of God, sound doctrine, we're, clean, we're a cleansed vessel. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse 22. Ephesians 5, 22. Five twenty, Ephesians 5.22 Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. So if the men and the, if the, the, men and the, uh, the wives do what they're told, they're, being, they're experiencing their sanctification. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. If the husbands obey what the Lord's saying there, Paul's saying, through the Spirit, uh, then you're experiencing your sanctification. You don't do this, you're not experiencing your sanctification, men. Verse 26, so that he might sanctify her, the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word. Notice he's equating water, the Word of God as like a, a cleansing agent in our souls, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Now go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21, in my translation. Therefore, if someone cleanses himself from these things, uh, false doctrine, the false teaching of the apostate pastors in, in the Roman province of Asia, they would do this by obeying the word of God, which would cleanse their soul and, give, and allow them to be sanctified, and so he says, if someone cleanses himself from these things, he will certainly exist in the state of being a vessel for honorable use. Consequently, he will specifically cause himself to be sanctified. That's what we're going to look at this evening. Useful for the master. That's, the way he's that's another way of describing experiencing your sanctification. Causing himself to be prepared for every kind of action which is divine good and quality and character. So there's a couple of things going on there. Uh, when you're doing this, as Paul says, if you're obeying the, uh, what he says here, and cleansing yourself from false doctrine by obeying the word of God and cleansing your soul with the word of God, the gospel, the result will be you'll experience your sanctification. And then he describes sanctification as being useful for the master and also being prepared. You'd be causing yourself to be prepared to, to perform every kind of action which is divine good and quality and character. So good works is related to sanctification. Uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can look at, uh, go, hold your place, look at sec, uh, Ephesians again. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. We often overlook this passage and we always look at it in related to, relation to sanctification. And uh, Ephesians 2.1, we always look at it in relation to uh, justification and also you know, uh, works can't save you, but God does want us to perform works. We're not saved on the basis of, of our, our own works, but we are saved for the purpose of performing good works. There's a difference. So it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the year, of the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God being rich in mercy because of, his, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, your position in Christ. 
so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. And a lot of Christians, they stop right there. Look at the very next verse. It's right with it. Here's why. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared, him, prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Uh, look at Titus. When we studied Titus, Paul says something in Titus is very similar to what he said in Ephesians. Look at Titus chapter 3, I believe it is. Yes. Look at Ephesians 3. Did you say Ephesians? Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Titus. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Sorry about that. Thank you for catching me. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them, the Cretan Christian community, to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, civil authorities, to be ready for every good deed, to, be li to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we also were once foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy and hateful, hating one another. Sounds just like Ephesians, right? But, sounds just like Ephesians too. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus uh, Christ our Savior, so that, being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And then he says, uh, this is a trustworthy statement concerning these things. I want you to speak confidently so that those who believe God will be careful to engage in good deeds, these things are good and profitable for men. So notice that good deeds are part of our sanctification. It manifests the fact that we're sanctified. In fact, when we're experiencing our sanctification, we will automatically perform good deeds. Because good deeds that are pleasing to God, that will be rewarded at the Bama seat, are the direct result of obeying the Spirit as he speaks to you and I through the word of God, the gospel. So go back now to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and look at verse 20. And look at your Bibles. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.20 Now in a large house there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore if anyone cleanses himself from these things... He'll be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. S sanctified, great word in the Greek New Testament, ayazo. And it means to be set apart exclusively for the Lord's purpose. And it speaks of the Christian experiencing sanctification by cleansing himself from the false teachings of the apostate pastors in Ephesus. The words in the perfect tense, it's what we call an intensive perfect, which means it's a, speaking of a present state produced by a past action. So here, that would speak of the Christian being sanctified as a result of the past action of obeying Paul's command to reject false doctrine. The, it's, the words in the passive voice as well, it's what we call a causative passive. We don't see these too much, too often, but it indicates that the Christian will cause himself to be sanctified if he cleanses himself from false doctrine. And how is he to do this? Again, by obeying Paul's command, which is inspired by the Holy Spirit. The verb is in the participle form as well. It's a result participle, which would indicate the, the Ephesian Christian will cause himself to be sanctified as a result of cleansing himself from the false teaching of the apostate teachers. Now, the participle, uh, this participle, ayazo, it's actually in the nominative case. It's a nominative in simple apposition, we call it, in Greek grammar. And that simply indicates here that this participle is identifying for the reader what Paul means specifically by a vessel of honor and to be sanctified. As I said before, a few moments ago, I said that the, uh, the, the phrase is useful for the master, causing himself to be prepared for every kind of action which is divine good and quality and character. Or as the New American Standard says, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. They're describing what sa experiencing sanctification is. It's describing it. 
So useful to the master, the word for useful is the word F Christos, and the, other, the word for uh, to the master is the word Thespotes, Thespotes, Despote, excuse me, it's the word for master, we get the word despot from it, so despotes is in the singular, it means master, it refers to the father here, despite the fact that the word's nearest antecedent is the noun kudios, lord, which appears in the command in 2 Timothy 2.19. Now the head of God's household is the father, that's why I'm saying when the word lord's being used there, or master, it's not speaking of Jesus Christ because we're talking about in the context of the metaphor and the father is the head of the household in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in God's family and not the son, Jesus Christ. He's the son, not the father, right? So the father has to be the Lord here because he's the head of the household and we're talking in the context of a household metaphor. So the head of, of God's household is the father and not the son. And in this metaphor, the, fa the father is the master of the large house, which is the church. Of course, as I pointed out. Now this word, the spotes, it's in the, it's in the dative case. It's a dative of advantage. With, and that would indicate that when the Ephesian Christian, or we could say when you and I, cleanse ourselves from false doctrine by obeying the word of God, we will be useful for the benefit of the Father. So if we avoid false doctrine, do what the Word of God says, we're going to be uh, doing things for the benefit of the Father. It's for the Father's benefit that we experience our sanctification and are a cleansed vessel by obeying, washing ourselves with the Word of God. And the reason why is because it'll glorify God. It'll glorify God because His power is working in our lives, namely the power of the Spirit and the power of the Word. So... And this results in God being glorified with our good works. And uh, the good works are useful to him. The adjective that's translated uh, useful, the F Christos, this word F Christos, excuse me, is the, means useful, helpful, profitable, beneficial, because it pertains to being of positive or good use. And here in 2 Timothy 2.21, this word speaks of being useful or beneficial to the Father. So if we want to be, as I said before, in the, uh, in the metaphor last week, in the study of the metaphor, you know, we want to be useful and beneficial, beneficial to the Father. Uh, if we're living, listening to false doctrine and disobeying the word of God and apostasy, we're actually no, of no use, no positive use. Yes, can he use us uh, despite our apostasy? Yeah, you know what he'll use you for? To advance a Christian who's positive and bring, you, bring, uh, bring, them into, bring you into their life so that you, they can learn how to operate in God's love and grow to maturity because of your apostasy and your ungodly conduct. Uh, so there's a lot of things God could do, but we want to be a vessel of honor. We want to be beneficial to him. Uh, we want to do things that are going to further his kingdom. Remember, we're talking in the, in the ancient world, remember, in Paul's day, they would understand this. In America, we don't, because we don't have slavery. But we don't have masters and slaves. But a, a slave in the first century, he's doing everything he can to please his master. And, well, in the same way, we should have the same attitude. We should be doing everything we can to please our Heavenly Father. Just like good children will do anything to please their mother and father, a, good, that, a, good, a great child is one who's eager to please their mother and father. That's a great child. And I have yet to see a perfect child to do that. Uh, we, uh, uh, that but uh, nonetheless, if we're going to be uh, good children, we want to be eager to please our parents. Well, in the same way, we want to be that way in God's household. And uh, one of the ways we can do that, bring it, break it down, is uh, why, uh, husbands, as we saw in Ephesians 5, Love your wives like Christ loved the church. Wives, obey your husband in all things as unto the Lord. Children, obey your parents in all things as unto the Lord. That's practical application of God's word. And when you're doing that, now you're being useful to the Father. He can use you and I when we're doing those things. So, this word too, F. Christos, is a, functioning as a nominative of simple, apposi simple apposition. And that seem, simply means that it's further identifying for us what Paul means when he says that the Christian who cleanses himself from the false teaching will be a vessel of honor and sanctified. So a cleansed vessel is defined as being useful to the master. Now, uh, and uh, then we have the phrase prepared for every good work, which completes the passage. Uh, the word that's translated prepared is a, is a word that's uh, uh, is, uh, 
the word prepared there, it's the word etimazo. Etimazo is a word that's uh, in the passive voice. It indicates that the Ephesian Christian who cleanses himself from the false teachings of the apostate pastors will have been prepared for every good work. So this word etimazo is a word that's in the, in the imperfect tense. It's an intensive perfect as well, like the previous verb in the voice. That speaks of the present state of the Christian being prepared for every good work as a result of cleansing himself from the false teachings of the apostate pastors in Ephesus. So if you see, everything stems from our attitude toward the word of God and our attitude toward false doctrine. We're to reject the false doctrine and take in sound doctrine, which is the word of God. Now, you heard me say this in the past. A lot of you have been with me for a long time. You're used to doing that. Um, you're used to listening to sound doctrine. But there are a lot of Christians today that will listen to a guy like Joel Olstein. They'll listen to one of these, these fake healers uh, like Benny Hinn on television. They'll listen to these people who are not teaching sound doctrine. They wouldn't teach, they wouldn't have, they've never taught a book in the Bible in their lives if they even look at a Bible. But if they quote it, they quote it out of context uh, to, to, uh, to take advantage of people and exploit people mo most times for money. So a lot of Christians are not being, uh, not cleansing themselves from false teaching. First of all, they never are humble enough to su submit to sound doctrine which would, and a pastor, who would, the pastor's job is to protect, feed you the, the sound doctrine, spiritual nourishment, but also to, to protect you from false doctrine. So a lot of these people, they don't like pastors who teach things like I do, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, chapter by chapter, and teach certain doctrines like sanctification, justification, the importance of confession of sin, the filling of the spirit, and they don't, and, and uh, 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 your stewardship of time, talent, treasure, and truth. They don't want to teach those things. Sanctification, I think, I don't know if I mentioned that. They don't want to talk about those things because that doesn't draw a crowd. And that doesn't keep the, uh, the offerings high. And that can't, doesn't give you any popularity uh, and, uh, and, and visibility. And, and we live in a sub celebrity culture in our day and age in, in Christianity. And these guys, that's what they're into. They're into being celebrities and making a lot of money. They're no different than the world. And of course, uh, if Christians listen to those guys, they're not cleansing themselves. Then they're, they're not a cleansed vessel. They're, con they're, they're contaminating their souls with sound, false doctrine. And that's all these, these, uh, these pastors can give you, these apostate pastors that we see out there in the internet land and on television. Now this word... Edimazo is in the passive voice. It's also a causative passage, uh, passive, which indicates that the Christian will cause himself to be prepared for every good work if he cleanses himself from the false teaching of the apostate pastor. So again, this emphasizes the volitional responsibility of the Christian and that he has to make a decision to either accept or reject the word of God, the gospel. And let me, let me tell you something. Again, a lot of Christians think that they're doing the right thing, obeying the word of God. But I know a lot of Christians today, they're, they're more following of, a, the, of the pastor because of his personality and his charisma rather than the content of his teaching or his character. They could care less about that. They're more concerned about how entertaining he is to them. Because we live in a culture in America where we, we, we make a big deal out of entertainment, whether it's sports or music or movies Whatever, they, they, they look at a pastor from, uh, how has he entertained me? And I know this because a lot of people will listen to guys who have ungodly character. They're in the papers, they're on the news about their god ungodly behavior. Yet Christians will still listen to these guys. And still, you, you, so you are, first of all, we have to, when we're listening to the word of God, we have to obey it. We have to obey it. If we're not obeying it, you, you, you know, a lot of people sit there and listen to a Bible class, but they're not applying it in their lives. Uh, and so therefore, they're not experiencing their sanctification. They're not experiencing God's power, the Spirit's power in their life, and transforming their lives and their priorities and their character into the image of Christ. I'll give you an example. Marriage. Christian, Christian people who listen to, the, mat, who listen to uh, the Word of God for decades, and yet they still can't handle the problem with their husband or their wife. And if you've been listening to the word of God for that for a long time, 10, 20 years, and you still don't know how to handle your spouse and the problems with your spouse, you're not being positive to the word of God. You're just not. You're stubborn, and you don't want to do things God's way, and you're fighting him. Instead of doing what God's word says, 
It's like a, st a, st a stubborn, disobedient teenager who wants to have, be pig-headed. Forget about the teenager. Little kid. You know, he wants his own way, and he's pig-headed. Well, I see Christian adults doing this today. You've got it, the word. You've been you, what, the word of God. You've been taught the word of God, and it talks. We taught, especially in this ministry. You've been taught how to love. You forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. If you have a complaint against your spouse or any Christian, forgive them. It says that in Colossians three, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, and and yet people. Well, Christians will cannot handle the problems with their husband or their wife, and they get all bent out of shape and get all upset, and they want to have a divorce, and blah, 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 and this, and that, and the other thing, and they're just not, they're stubborn. That's not how you handle your problem with your wife or your husband, Christians. It's clear, but we don't want to apply what it says because we're stubborn. We've made a volitional decision, and we can sit there, you can sit there and listen to me, and I, I'll tell you what, forget about me. So you won't get subjective. You could hear, listen to, listen to Jesus for 24-7. Jesus is actually right bodily here teaching. You could listen to him or Paul or Moses for 24-7. But if you're not willing to do what it say, they say, you're stubborn and you're not going to experience your sanctification and you're pig-headed. So we have to make a decision. And this means, listen, this means that we have to ask God first for help. We also say, God, I'm stubborn. I have a hard time with these things, and I fight you. I, I forgive me for that, but help me to be, help me to get better every single day. Help me to apply what I know in the Bible with my husband and my wife and my kids and my parents and my pastor and my congregation help, and my neighbors. Help me to apply what I already know. We have to learn to recall Scripture, and that means we have to take some time every day sanctified time, and a prayerful study of the Word of God and meditate upon what we're learning in Bible class and how am I going to bring this into my marriage? How am I going to bring this into my life? So we see here that the, this word edimazo, prepared, it's in the participle form. It's a result participle, which would indicate that the Ephesian Christian will cause himself to be prepared for every good work as a result of cleansing himself from the false teaching. Now this participle is also... In a nominative and simple apposition, indicating that the participle is identifying for the reader, you and I, what Paul means specifically when he speaks of a vessel of honor and sanctified. Now, in 2 Timothy 2.21, the word that's translated deed, it's the word, it's the word uh, eron, and this word eron is in the singular, it means work or action, and because it pertains to actions performed by the Christian while in fellowship with God, and they're produced by the Holy Spirit through him when they exercise faith in the word of God. Now, don't miss this. I don't think, this is why I want you to start listening carefully about when I talk about the Spirit's work in our life through the word of God. The Holy Spirit, when you're obeying the Holy Spirit, he's working through you. Let me repeat that. When you're obeying the Holy Spirit, is he speaking to you through the teaching of the word of God, whether it's your pastor or your own private study. When you're doing what the Spirit says, then the Spirit's working through you. Then Jesus is working through you. Then the Father's working through you, because they work in concert. And that's when you start, when, you, when your actions are the result of obedience to the Spirit's speaking to you through the Word of God, you're going to be forming actions that are actually divine in quality and character. Because it's the Spirit that's working through you. You're just a willing agent who is allowing God to work in your life. and We're allowing God to work in our lives. And that's exciting. I don't think, think about that more often. God wants to work in our lives. So this word eron is, in the, uh, is modified by the adjective agathos, which it means uh, divine good and quality and character. So when it means good, it says every good deed, uh, every, uh, every uh, good deed. The word good there is agathos. It speaks of good, but in the sense of it's divine and quality and character. Uh, and, uh, and it describes this uh, work or action as good in the sense that it's divine in quality and character because it's in accordance with the Father's will. This word agathos, good, describes this work or action as being intrinsically valuable, intrinsically good, inherently good in quality, but with the idea of good, which is also profitable, useful, benefiting others, 
benevolent because it's based upon and motivated by the teaching of the Spirit and the Word of God. So what, he sa- what I'm saying here is when we're obeying the Spirit, as he speaks to us through the teaching of the Word of God, and as a result we're doing, committing, performing actions that are empowered by the Spirit, and thus they're divine in quality and character, those works will automatically benefit the, the Trinity, they'll benefit you, enabling you to grow to maturity, and also it'll benefit your church, it will also benefit the non-Christian community. Now this word that's translated every, it's the adjective pas, it means every kind of, it emphasizes various types of acts that benefit others and are motivated by the Spirit and obedience to the Spirit. Let's think of some of these acts. It could be you went to, God's word says you love your neighbor as yourself. It could be that you help your neighbor who doesn't have a car and you help them go to work. You know, they have to walk to work. They don't have a car. They're in need. And you dr- help them. You drive them to work. It could be that you're, uh, you go and see somebody who is an older person. And they're elderly. And you go and help, say, hey, you need anything at the store. And you go get something at the store for them. You're doing it because God's word says you're supposed to love your neighbors yourself. You know, and you treat others the way you'd want to be treated. Uh, it could be that, you know, somebody has uh, uh, done something wrong to you whether a Christian or a non-Christian, and has actually done something terrible to you. And yet, God's word says, forgive them as God in Christ has forgiven you, and you don't retaliate. God's, God's doing something through you. God's working through you. And those, so those, there are various types of acts. It could be anything is what I'm saying. It could be anything, in, anything you could do in life could, that could help somebody, but you're helping them because you're not doing it because you want to get approbation for people and blow a horn like the Pharisees and say, look what I'm doing for people. You know, you're doing it because God's asking you to do it, telling you to do it, commanding you to do it because he's done things for you when you were his enemies and doing things now for you and, and grace and we should respond in kind and do what he asks us to do and obey his word and we obey God's word. We're automatically going to help uh, be a benefit to God and other people automatically. Now the word eron is the object, that's the word for deed there. It's the object of the preposition is, and this word is a marker of purpose indicating that the Ephesian Christian who cleanses himself from the false teaching of the apostate pastors will cause himself to be prepared for the purpose of performing every kind of action which is divine good and quality and character. Now look at 2 Timothy 2.20 again in my translation. Second Timothy 2.20, Paul says, Indeed, in a large home, by no means does there exist only gold as well as silver vessels, but also wood as well as clay. In other words, on the one hand, some do exist in the state of being for honorable use, while on the other hand, some do exist in the state of being for dishonorable use. Now here's the explanation of the metaphor. Therefore, if someone, any Christian, doesn't matter who we are, they are, cleanses himself from these things, the false teachings, he will certainly exist in the state of being a vessel for honorable use. Consequently, he will specifically cause himself to be sanctified. And then he describes sancti- experiencing your sanctification. Useful for the master, causing himself to be prepared for every kind of action which is divine good and quality and a- character. So sanctification is dealing with our conduct, our actions, and our relationship to God. We, when we're experiencing our sanctification, we're useful to our Heavenly Father. And we're also going to be a benefit to our fellow human being. Don't miss that. It's two directions. There's the vertical. Sanctification is, rela- is, is, is related to the vertical, our relationship with God. This vertical means this way. And I remember one time I was listening to a playback one time, and I was like, in the vertical, I was like, I can just imagine somebody's thinking, this guy's got to be loaded or something. He must be drugs or something. No, sometimes I make a mistake, and I'm sure Cheyenne or somebody will correct me and say, no, and this means this. So horizontal, sanctification is related to the horizontal, meaning each other, the human beings. And doesn't it say in the Bible, you love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, strength, and neighbors are, se- and then what? Neighbors are self. Okay? Horizontal, vertical, horizontal. God's the vertical. Horizontal is our fellow human being. Could be Christian, could be non-Christian. 
Now, Paul states in 2 Timothy 2.21, that the Ephesian Christian will cause himself to be sanctified as a result of cleansing, cleansing himself from the false teaching of the apostate pastors in, uh, in Ephesus. Now, he identifies specifically, as we see, for Timothy, what he means by a Christian becoming a vessel of honor by cleansing himself from false doctrine. He identifies for him that by cleansing himself, by cleansing oneself from this false teaching, the Christian will cause himself to be sanctified, which speaks of the Christian experiencing being set apart to serve the Father exclusively. He is teaching that the Ephesian Christian will cause himself to be sanctified if he cleanses himself from false doctrine by obeying Paul's command, which is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we immediately cleanse ourselves from false doctrine when we cleanse ourselves with the washing of the water of the Word. We cleanse our soul, think of the Word of God and the Spirit's work, you, always, you notice that we've seen a couple of passages. The Spirit and the Word are, re, are used in analogies with water as a cleansing agent. So we cleanse our soul from all the garbage in it with the Word of God. Let me tell you something. You don't realize, and I don't realize, how much garbage we actually have in our heads from the devil's world. We have no idea, you know, you know when you really start seeing, boy, I can't believe all the garbage that was in my head, is as you grow up spiritually, you realize, wow, all the crazy things that were in my head that we didn't really were aware of. So that's why I say, shut the TV off. TV, you know, TV is a waste of time, unless there's some good thing, you know, once in a while they have some good things, but most of the television shows are absolute junk. They're garbage. They, they put things, ideas in people's head. Now we have a culture today in America. It's just a joke. You know, it's the pop culture with no content, no character, no depth. Nobody reads anymore. You know, I'm talking about the country in general. You know, you get all these hip-hop, you know, ignorant, you know, slang, can't speak English, can't, you know, don't... No, everybody don't know how to act with anybody. Nobody puts their blinker on anymore when they drive. <laughs> There's all these, this, this society that we're living in is a, it's just, it's just silly. It's crazy. It's crazy. And they, it's all because they have no truth. They're just, they've fallen for the lies of Satan's cosmic system. Well, God wants us to cleanse us of all that garbage that's in the, in his, in the devil's world. God wants to cleanse our soul. So listen to me. That's why I always said, I don't care what your problem is in life. There's nothing that God's word is not sufficient enough to take care of that problem. You got issues of identity and insecurity and anger issues. You were abused as a kid. Uh, you, were, you had an alcoholic mother and father. There's nothing that God's word can't help you to overcome and give you victory. If you don't think so, that means you don't believe in the sufficiency of scripture. I believe, and I've seen it in my life, and I've seen it in other people, other Christians, that God, the Holy Spirit, can do amazing things when a Christian gives God's word a chance and obeys what the Spirit is saying in the word of God. It will, and if you, and let me tell you something. Holiness, sanctification is related to holiness, by the way. And the Christian, where Paul, Peter said uh, in 1 Peter, look, go, uh, hold your place, look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, we're coming near the end here, believe it or not. Where to be holy? Well, holiness is not, you know, growing to maturity, experiencing a sanctification, which is a moment my moment experience. But to grow up to maturity, to become like Christ, it's a long process, guys. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. It takes, a, it takes a long time to grow up spiritually. It takes a long time and a lot of hard work and a lot of failures Blood, sweat, and tears. Because, but once you, once, as, you go, as you keep going forward, you see what God has done in your life and how he's changed your life and how much happy you are. And, but you've got to give God a chance. You can't give up on him and quit on him. You've got to let God's word do something in your life. Give him a chance. You know? look, at, look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. As obe oh, actually, look at verse 13 to start. 1 Peter 1.13, therefore prepare your minds for action. Notice the thinking is all critical, as I've been pointing out. Keep sober in spirit. 
And in fact, there's a passage as we start in Second Timothy to listen to be deceived by false doctrine is actually to be synonymous is is equated with being drunk in the natural realm, whereas listening to sound doctrine, obeying it, is like being sober. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Meaning, live in light of the imminency of the rapture and the and the bama seat, where you're going to get rewards for faithful service. Don't forget that. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts, which were yours in your ignorance prior to becoming a Christian. But like the Holy One, Jesus, who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Leviticus 11.44. Now, listen to me. God says we're to be holy. He would never give us a command if, we, if he didn't give us the capacity to fulfill it. Now, how do we have the capacity? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit indwell our bodies. There's your capacity. You're identified with Christ in his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session. The co implication is you're dead to the sin nature. You're dead to the law. You're free to serve God as totally and exclusively. You've been sanctified, set apart for his purposes exclusively. You got freedom. That's freedom. Freedom is not like they said in the 60s where you, know, you could have sex with ever, whoever you want and do all the drugs you want. I have freedom. Yeah, and now you got... All kinds of problems with AIDS and, and, and venereal, uh, L STDs they call them. We used to call them VD. We used to call them VD, STD. You got all that and you got all, this, um, this, all these destroyed marriages and all these illegitimate kids out there who don't have any two parents in the home anymore. You got a, tr a society that's crumbling from within. Yeah, that was the result of the freedom of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s and up to the present. That's not freedom. That's in slavery to sin. We've been freed from those former lusts. We don't have to be like the world. In fact, we're to stick out. That's why we got people coming in, uh, the Fletchers coming in, and, the, uh, and, and, and hopefully uh, uh, Lori and Dennis can come in, and Vaughn and Debbie. And I want everybody who's out here in Iowa, I want us, big thing as I'm concerned, I want everybody, I want us to conduct ourselves in a godly fashion and bring glory to God as a group. And the same thing when we do that conference out there at gyms. It's very important that we distinguish ourselves with our godly behavior before the world. Because we're supposed to be a light in the world of this darkness of Satan's cosmic system. So you go back to 2 Timothy 2.21, we'll wrap this up. So Paul's teaching in 2 Timothy 2.21 that the Ephesian Christian will cause himself to be sanctified if he cleanses himself from false doctrine by obeying Paul's command, which is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Paul then further identifies for Timothy what he means when he says that the Christian who cleanses himself from the false teaching will be a vessel of honor. Not only will he cause himself to be sanctified, but he will be useful to the Father who Paul describes as the Master. Paul's also describing for Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.21 what he means by sanctification. To be a vessel of honor and sanctified means that one is useful for the Father. He then defines for Timothy what it means to be useful for the Father, which is that the Christian is prepared for every kind of work which is divine in quality and character. So as we saw earlier in the evening in Ephesians 2, we're saved for good works, not on the basis of good works, but for good works, because now we have the spirit, we have the capacity to perform actions that are pleasing to God, and that's exciting to know. I don't know about you. I hope you're listening to the, what the spirit's saying here. That's exciting. God can work through you and I. In fact, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, who's indwelling us. I mean, what, we're, we should have an indomitable spirit. We should have every day should be an exciting day. And this, I'm not saying everything goes great, but an exciting, oh, look, what is God going to do today? You know, is it adversity? Is it prosperity? Is it encouragement? Is it going to be a discouraging situation? What's it going to happen? What does God want me to do today? Okay, I'm going to get adversity today? Okay, what, can, what, am I, what, what do you want me to do? Well, obey my word, Bill. And deal with the adversity the best you can. Show them, I'll do what I taught you and study. And, and I want you to go and not watch me work in your life through adversity. Prosperity, whatever it is. This person's coming in your life. This is what God, this is what I taught you what to do, Bill. Now let's see what God's going to do it through you 
and helping that person. You're all like that. Put your name in there. Not Take mine out, put Jody, put Tyler, put Lori, put Vaughn and Debbie, put Bill and Crystal, T uh, Mark and Christina, Tony and Susan. Put, plug any name you want. Tyler. I almost forgot. Hey, I gotta, now I have to remember every Titus, I got to remember everybody's name. If I leave it out, somebody will be mad at me. No, I'm just... So all of you... If I forgot any of you, didn't mention your names, please forgive me. And don't, uh, you know, Mike and Carol Ann, almost forgot them. Lori and, uh, and, and uh, George, almost forgot George's name, poor George. One of the most handsomest men I know. And, uh, you gotta, and, and, and Pixie, we can't forget Pixie. And so this, God can work each, through each one of us guys. And how does he do that again? I hope you know. Holy Spirit, obey what he says in the, in the teaching of the word of God. Now, as we wrap this up, when Paul says, for every kind of work which is divine, good, and quality and character, that pertains to actions performed by the Christian while in fellowship with God and are produced by the Holy Spirit through him when they exercise faith in the Word of God. It speaks of the acts, actions or works that the Holy Spirit performs through the Christian as a result of the Christian's obedience to the commands and prohibitions in the Word of God which are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Everything is obedience to the word of God. And if we, obedience manifests what? Our faith in the word of God. You're not going to obey God if you don't trust him. If you trust what his word says, you're going to obey him. It, in fact, that's what it says in, to, throughout the scriptures. Abraham believed God and, he, and he, he obeyed his command and he moved to, to Canaan. Doesn't it say, where is it? you don't have to go there. What does it say in, a, in Hebrews chapter 11? Don't go there. Stay right there. Because I want to close. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and what did it say? It says, uh, by faith, Hebrews 11, 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, he obeyed. It was by faith that he obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance and he went out not knowing where he was going. Faith produces obedience, people. So these actions that Paul mentions in 2 Timothy 2.21 are divine good in quality and character because they're intrinsically valuable, intrinsically good, inherently good in quality, but with the idea of good which is also profitable, useful, benefiting others, benevolent because it's based upon and motivated by the teaching of the Spirit and the Word of God. So these actions, which are divine in quality and character, benefit the Trinity, the body of Christ, and all of mankind. What does fruit do? You know, we're talking about fruit, bearing fruit. That's, that's what he's talking about, producing good works. Fruit benefits the person, benefits people, because you eat it and gives you nourishment. Hey, it's great, tastes good. Well, our good works are like fruit in the natural realm. They benefit people. They benefit God, of course. Paul is speaking of, here in 2 Timothy 2.21 of performing various types of acts that benefit the Trinity, the church, and the non-Christian community and are motivated by the Spirit and obedience to the Spirit's teaching and the Word of God. So the purpose, as we close here, the purpose of sanctification is for the Christian to perform actions which are divine, good, and quality and character which benefit the Trinity, the church, and the non-Christian community or unregenerate humanity. And that's exciting to know that God can work through us and wants to, and that's why he saved us for good works. So let's close and pray to be a great audience. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this class will be a blessing to your people. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.